Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Pardon me. Welcome to the new Live Wax with Christian McBride. It's great to have you all out there this evening. This is episode, I don't know which episode is this. Is this 13? 13 weeks we've been doing this now or something like that. And uh, it's been nothing but fun uh, talking with my friends and um, these fantastic musicians and getting to interact with all of you out there. And uh, tonight's episode is going to be no less fun and no less riveting than the previous ones. Um, hope you all are staying safe out there. I'm very, very, very sorry uh, for all of you guys out there in, in California and down in Florida, my friends in Texas. Um, the virus is hitting you guys very hard and uh please please stay safe all right um we got we got to get this thing back together so we can get out gigging again so do what you know you need to do to make rona get out of town <laughs> she keeps it she keeps calling the front desk and extending her welcome you know she's like no nah, i'm not ready to check out yet i need like four or five more days you know so uh we all put those masks on she'll be checking out getting out of Dodge so uh, until that time comes you all please 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 stay safe um, what can I say about tonight's guest Cecile McLaurin Sauvant it's it's amazing like one day one day I didn't know who she was and then like there came a point where like I saw her like every day like <laughs> <laughs> she became like a major, major figure quickly. And when I say she became a major figure quickly, I don't mean that she became like this sort of like, you know, VH1 MTV star. I mean, like she had like instant credibility inside of the jazz world, you know, and it's amazing to me um just how her career has just shot to the moon and rightfully so because um, not only is she so extremely talented but she's also cool she's cool and I keep trying to tell young musicians that all the time they want to you know how do I get out there how do I get some gigs you know how do how do I you know make myself known I said okay well first and foremost you have to be cool all right what does that mean that means, you know, if someone says hello to you, you say hello back. Somebody calls you for a gig, you call them back. Somebody says, hey, you sounded wonderful. You say, thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Real basic stuff like that. And, um, you know, she is just a, a fantastic artist. And uh, I, I mean that, like, not just a singer, but many of you know she is a world-class visual artist as well. And... Um, I'm very, very excited to be speaking with her. So uh, let me see if she's there. Uh, yes, there she is. Let's bring her in. The great Cecile McLaurin Savant. Drum roll. I stopped doing my mouth drum rolls. They start sounding more like drills. There she is. Wait a minute. I thought I brought her in. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Hit the wrong button. Hey. Yo! <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't know how to get... get no, no, no. I, that was my bad. How are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm happy to see you. You look fantastic. Oh, thank you for saying that. You do. Please, I, I haven't shaved in like five days. I I could I could scrub my I, I I could use this as Brillo pad to scrub the pans in my <laughs> sink right now. <laughs> now where are you? I am in Brooklyn in my apartment. Ah, nice, nice. Yeah. I hope you guys are staying safe over there. Yes, very. Right on. You and Sullivan Fortner have been doing the most amazing things online, keeping all of our Thank spirits you. up and uh, 
giving us such great vibes. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. That means a lot. I don't know if you heard what I said about you, but uh, I, I said this to you many times before, but like all of a sudden it was just like, I, I, I go to the bodega like up on uh, 123rd and, and Lenox Avenue and people in there talking about, hey, you know Cecile McGonagall Savant? I go to Newark, New Jersey to like, um, uh, you know, the, the video game shop to get my Madden uh, 2010, and the guy behind the counter is like, no. hey, you know Cecile McCormick, uh -huh. huh? yeah, game, GameStop, that's what I meant. I was like, it was like everywhere, you know? I don't believe you, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. I'm in the, air, I'm in the airport in like uh, um, uh, um, Ankara, Turkey, and I'm checking in, and the woman's like, you know Cecile McCormick, so huh? <laughs> Jeez, man. So <laughs> it's the truth. But uh let, let's let's bring it all the way back. Uh you're such a great singer, you're a great um visual artist. Take us all the way back to the days of uh Miami. Uh so I was born and raised there. Uh my parents are immigrants. My mom is French and my dad is Haitian. And they both love music. So when I was really young, my mom put me in my first piano class when I was, I think I must've been four classical piano lessons until mm. the age of 18. I, I was in the choir, the youth choir. Then I did some, some classical voice lessons uh, because I wanted to be an opera singer. But I was, I was a nerd. I mean, I was mostly in school too. I wasn't, I, I didn't do much music with other people. I just did my private lessons. And then I was, I was in a French program in school. Uh, um, and I was, I was really into school actually. <laughs> so did you learn, so you didn't learn French at home necessarily. You learned it at school? No, I learned it at home. We only, I, I have a big sister. We were allowed to only speak French at home. Ooh, that's awesome. Yes. Yeah, it was good. It was, and it, it was my first language. I mean, uh, we only spoke French at, at, at home. So I learned English basically when I went to pre-K, wow. um, which is great. So it wasn't, it wasn't hard. I mean, there are other languages I would love to learn, but I'm realizing as an adult, it's kind of hard to, to get into it. I mean, you have to have some, some kind of discipline with it. And, right, right. Yeah. Can you explain to the average American how much the world opens up when you can speak a second language? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like for me, a big one is humor because I feel like humor and language are very connected. And when uh -huh. you can really speak fluently a language, you can get the subtleties of the humor to an extent. And I feel like that's, I mean, that's so fun. Like that's, that's one right. fun thing about it. I also, I think learning how to make different sounds and, you know, French and English are not so different in terms of, well, they are kind of different in terms of sound. But I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure there are other languages that are even further out, you know, but, right. but I feel like it teaches you how to, how to, place your mouth in different right. ways and come up with different sounds. And I think it, it sort of opens that up a little bit. Yeah. I, I always love sort of studying different dialects of English. You know, there's like uh, UK English, there's American English, there's uh, Caribbean English, and they all have like different sounds. Yes. So can you give us an example of like what you were here in France versus what you were here in Haiti versus what you were here in Canada? I cannot. Because I'm really? terrible at accents. I don't believe you. I'm terrible. Um, but it is very distinct. And I, and I also feel like the Haitians in here will, will school <laughs> me. Because um, I actually don't speak Creole. I don't want to get you in trouble. I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. And also, any French Canadians are going to school me too. But it is a very different... I mean, it's just like if I were to try to do an Australian accent. Like, right, I could try, right. but it would be bad. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you, you just keep singing the way you do, and that, that's going to make everybody happy. 
all your kind. <laughs> it's the truth. So, so you wanted to be an opera singer. Um, now, when did you start singing? When did you get interested in singing jazz? Well, I had always loved Sarah Vaughn from a really young age. Uh, my mom used to blast her. Um, she used to blast Dinah Washington on the speakers. Uh, Nancy Wilson. So I heard them from a really, really young age, from before I can even remember. And I loved them. But I think I didn't realize that you could do that, that one could still sing jazz, as odd as that sounds. <laughs> mm. um, I had never seen really musicians live. Um, most of the musicians that I was listening to were dead. Um, right. So so I didn't know that there was that it was in the air and that it was happening still, you know. Yeah. Um, so it it took me until I moved to France and started going to the music school there and seeing that they had a jazz program that I started singing with with the students. I mean, I became a student at that school and started playing with bands. And it was my first time sort of interacting with a bass player, for instance, uh -huh. or drums, you know, and that's I don't know for for someone who's so used to just singing alone or singing with a teacher, when you get that first moment where you can interact with other musicians, it's yeah. just a, it's riveting. It's, oh, it's a, high. Yeah. <laughs> it's a high. Yeah. Did you maintain your piano chops when, when you when you moved to France? I the piano chops definitely dropped off mm. completely. And my teacher actually um, was very frustrated with that so he would he would force me to play so i and i remember actually when i i won the monk competition in 2010 and i was still going to the small french music school is that right time. yeah and i remember when i won it i came back to the school and he said okay you're not singing here anymore you're just playing piano in trios and stuff wow <laughs> so he forced me but it was <laughs> it was terrible but but at least i was forced into that seat you know um and i think now lately i've been i've been reading more just sight reading every day and, and going through like a lot of bach and really enjoying that and tr and i think i'm i'm better now than i was when i was um 18. so that's something but look it, out it's world not <laughs> it's not feels back it's on not the piano much. watch out no, everybody no 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 Do oh you play? man uh, not in public. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I play all kinds of piano in the house. <laughs> I, I sound like an inebriated McCoy Tyner when I play the piano. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of when you won the Monk competition in 2010, because that's kind of like when I started. You know, you won that competition and you just shot the stardom. What, um, other than going back to school and having your teacher force you to only play the piano, um, when did things start sort of opening up for you professionally? Um, it was a really slow build before that competition, but I have to say that thanks to that competition, I met a bunch of American people, like musicians, but also uh, managers, agents, labels, and that definitely opened things up. But it took a sure. couple of years. It took a couple of years, for sure. And did you sign with, um, you went to Mac Avenue? Was that your first yes. record label? Yes. Yeah. And um, actually, before you, before you sign to Mac Avenue, paint that picture for me when you win the Monk competition. And like you say, you got all these agents, managers, mus musicians industry people just like, hey, winner, you won. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you probably had to be like, you know, back up, get away from me. <laughs> I mean, I, first of all, I, I was sure I wouldn't win. Like, hmm. I, I was sure that I, I was, the shock on my face, it was people still talk to me about that. They're like, you were shocked. <laughs> so I was not prepared at all for any kind of, attention at all but I will say it wasn't 
it what everything happened kind of gradually it wasn't like people weren't calling me every day you know I went back to France I went back to my apartment back to my life back to my music school right and things started to build up slowly and and I also learned about the whole thing of like people saying hey we should play together <laughs> and then that's not real that's not a real thing <laughs> yeah man let's hook up yes yeah <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> what? So when did you move to New York? I moved for one semester at the new school in 2012. And then I left and came back, I think, in 14, 2014, something like that. When did we hang out in, um, uh, where were we, in Orvieto? Yes. Was that? Yes. That was 2015, wasn't it? It might have been. It might have been, yeah. So you had only been in New York for a year? Something basically. like that. Yeah, basically. Wow. That's two. amazing. Yeah. Because I felt like I, you know, I, I feel like that was the first time you and I actually ever had a chance to sit in a room and talk and, you know, yes. kind of kind of get to know each other. And I felt like I had known you for a long time. It's funny because I feel like I would hang well, now I don't hang it. No one hangs. No one's hanging out. out yeah, exactly. Right? But I think when I was living in Miami and just coming to New York from time to time, I was hanging out more. And I would, like, people thought that I lived in New York more than they do now. Even. Right, right. It's like a thing where you're just, like, you're visiting, so you're going out a lot more. You're, you're hanging with friends. And then now that I live here, I'm just kind of home. <laughs> right, 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 right. Now, tell us about your um, your talent as a visual artist. Where did that come from? Um, so I have a lot of visual artists in my family. And I'll say that, first of all, my mom and sister are both really incredible visual artists. And they do all kinds of different stuff. Uh, but they never show their work. They've always just done it as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And I started doodling when I was on tour. I think I was in Japan and I bought like this really nice Japanese sketchbook and like a really nice pen. And I started just drawing. And actually when I was a kid in high school, I used to draw weird stuff on my notebooks, like really weird <laughs> monsters <laughs> and creatures. Um, but then it dropped off until when I was back on tour, you know, as you know, there's a lot of downtime. A lot, a lot of time, of right. Around. Right. And so I just started doodling and doodling, and then I got into watercolors, and then I got bigger, and then now I've been doing um, embroidery on large. Wow. Stuff. Like, there's no way you're going to see all of it, but right. it's, this is big. This is like six feet or something. That's amazing. And the thing that's great about this is I can make a huge drawing, but since everything folds, I can do small things on the plane. So like right. this is how big, this is the size that I'm working with, but the piece itself Ooh. is, you know. Whoa. I have to <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible, Cecile. It's it's so much fun, and I really love it. And I did I did one little art show in Harlem a few years ago. Yes. Uh, with, with this girl named Grace Parisi, she helped me with everything, and it was amazing. And I had a lot of fun. And I'm I'm working on a new one, but with this new method, like with this embroidery stuff, I have to I have to wait because it takes months and months to finish one. Right. So, right. So when you go on the road, you, you, you must carry a lot of stuff with you, all your materials and, and things like that. Well, not with this. With this, I just literally fold this up mm -hmm. like this. And yeah. I have a needle and some thread, some scissors. And that's it, huh? That's it. Wow. So it's, it's easy. I mean, I, if I were painting... <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You need. No you, you definitely would need a lot more. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Yeah. I want to shout out um, two legends who um, have been my previous guests who are on the thread tonight. Your buddy Anak Cohen, <laughs> uh, sir, on the thread, 
and the great yes. Diane Reeves. What? Yes. Yes. Diane almost texted you earlier today. I mean, Diane, boy, she's she's on top of it, man. I love her. <laughs> every time I, every time Kat's got something going on online, she's there checking it out. Thank you, it. Diane. Thank you. Thank you. You know, yeah. I'll never forget my first my first Diane concert that I went to was in Marciac. I must have been, I think, 16. And it was incredible. I think I'm she was sure. on a double bill with Madeline Peru. Mm. It was in the in the big tent. Yeah. And it was just it was just th this moment of grace and subtlety and power and I've rarely seen someone so, she's so focused. She's so yeah, focused. Yeah. And the vo I mean, of course, the voice is maddeningly beautiful. Yeah, well, you know, I always tell Diane, it's like, she must have a complex because what she can do is just so unfair. <laughs> 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 I want to, Diane, do you walk around the house going, oh, I'm so, I'm so, wow, I'm <laughs> just amazing. <laughs> I hope so. Should if you sure. did, we can understand. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I think you could do that too, my friend. No, no. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You have so much. Everybody respects you from the elders to the mid-career cats to all the young cats. They say, who are the top five baddest cats? Now, I say cats like neutral. That could be anybody. Old, young, male, female, whatever. You are always up high on, on everybody's list. Thank you. And um, I don't know what it is about you, but uh, this whole thing that you do with the, the way you sing, this this outlet you have with uh, your, with your visual art, it's just... Um, I, I feel like somebody with that level of talent that you have and the inspiration that you give to other people, I would assume that you're probably, um, you think different. Um, oh. I, I, I love the fact that you were a nerd in school. <laughs> Seriously, because uh, me and and Questlove and Kurt Rosenwinkel, Joey DeFrancesco, we were all nerds in school. You know, besides listening to records, we were the only geeks that would study like the credits. And I don't mean like the musicians. I'm talking about the studio, yeah. the mastering engineer, um, all all kinds of stuff. You know, so um, that's great that you're a nerd. You How know, it's funny. I I I was watching one of the. Have you ever watched these actors roundtable things? All the time. I love those. They're awesome. <laughs> so I was watching one. I think it was. I don't remember who it was with. Anyway, one of the people, one of the actors said that to him, a nerd was somebody who loves things that it takes work to love. And I love, I'm that's like, right. that's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I love that. How are you dealing? I don't mean to get too deep on you right now, but <laughs> okay. the kind of talent that you have and the kind of inspiration that you emote to other people. How are you dealing with the pandemic and all of the social upheaval going on right now? How does your how does your artistry how does this filter through your art? Um all right. So the way that I've been dealing with it is definitely up and down. There are some days where I feel like I have everything under control, mm -hmm. I have my emotions under control, I'm healthy, I'm mentally healthy. There are other days where things disintegrate <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Um, I also, I think, I mean, from the beginning of this has been, I've been worried, I have to say, I've been worried for my family for my friends because i'm a little bit of a hypochondriac on top of everything so i'm just overly cautious and i'm it's exhausting to be overly cautious mm -hmm. um and then with the social upheaval i mean it's there's something really exciting and energizing about it 
and I went to a protest and I remember the people who were leading us is three guys, three black guys. Um, they were all 18, 19, 17, leading us in protest. And that made me so emo, I mean, I was so emotional. I really, I, it was incredible. But the other thing, the other side of it is that sometimes, and I, I might get crucified, but sometimes it feels a little bit like you know, white people discovered slavery last week. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they're saying, they're saying, oh, did you know? And you're like, well. Yeah, I knew. <laughs> but, thank you, but thank you for your, for, thank you. So it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. And I feel yeah. like with, with my art, I mean, I mean art, with what I'm trying to do with my, my creative output, it's been, in a way, it's been good for me to not be traveling around and to actually be in one place and have a routine and actually be able to sit and write and make things. Yeah. Um, but I, but whether or not my, the, the stuff that I'm making is in response to what's happening, I feel like it'll take more time. I feel like it's still, I'm still processing a lot of things and I feel like, it's, I can't write a song about coronavirus right. now or even about how it makes me feel. I think that's going to, I'm a, what is it called? Delayed, delayed reaction. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel you. You're letting it, it's, it's, it's manifesting. What about you? Well, you, you just about took the words right out of my mouth because um, people, people somehow think I'm never anything below ecstatic all the time right and so when people find out that i actually get sad or upset or you know anxiety written they're like oh, no and yesterday was a pretty bad day for me in fact and um in the past i would just take a deep breath and uh go get myself a drink i still do that on occasion but uh Yesterday, I decided to just um, sit in silence for a little while. Wow. You know, just sit in the TV room with the TV, with the TV not being on and just just sat there and breathed, you wow. know, just breathe it out, you know. And then after that, I was cool. You know, I sat in there for about a good right hour, what? you know. Yeah, you know. Melissa was on the couch, you know, you know, taking a little nap, and I just sat there quietly, just um, got lost in my own brain, which sometimes is dangerous. But <laughs> last night, it was one of those moments where I said, okay, let me just, I'm not going to listen to the news. I'm not going to listen to any music. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit here and meditate. Just let the I silence ease my angst, you know. Wow. I'm going to try you know? that. Yeah. Yeah. That seems long. I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could stand it. Well, I, I had my dog too, so he he kept me company. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, bring us up to. Um, actually, I want to ask you about the collaborations you did for so many years with Aaron Deal. Tell me how you and Aaron wound up getting together and making such great music together? So I needed to play with some musicians for a gig that I had in Boston or I don't know where. And I was still living in France at the time. I knew no one. Mm. So I asked my manager to send me like a list, like, please send me 20 piano players and I'll look them up. So he sent me a list and I wish, I need to pull that back up and see who I know from that list. Cause at the time, all of those names were just a bunch of letters together. I was like, I don't wow. know. And so I went through all of them and I heard Aaron play Viper's Drag. Mm -hmm. And I, First of all, I was so excited to see somebody play Fats Waller in an interesting and different way. 
And so I thought, oh, I would love to, I would love to play with him. And so we started Skyping because I was still living in France and just like talking about the, the gig. And the gig went really well. We, we played with Paul Sakivi. I forget who the drummer was. It was probably Rodney Green for that first gig. Um, and it was, it was just a really, it felt like family. It felt, yeah. and it felt easy. And I get, always get so nervous when I play with new people and I'm always scared and it felt, I, I didn't feel as scared as I could have. Um, and on top of all of that, his musicianship was, was incredible. And, um, and I learned a lot, learned a yeah. lot on that first gig, but also in, in all of the time that we've been working together and now it's been it's been so long it's really like family you know right right also in that group um was our dearly departed brother lawrence low leathers yes and uh how are you doing with the loss of lawrence because i know you guys were tight you guys worked together uh for a long time and the way he left us was just so um incredibly sad and tragic how, how are you doing with that Thank you for, for asking and thank you for mentioning him. Um, I mean, I miss him. Yeah. And I carry very mixed emotions, same thing. It's like I carry some guilt, which I think is normal, um, especially due to the circumstance. Like it, it feels, not that I had anything to do with it, but it, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a level of feeling like it didn't have to happen. Right. You know, he didn't die of natural causes. It was horrific. Right. Um, I'm, I'm also very grateful for the time that I spent with him and I think of him often and it's become, I mean, I, I, I lost it when, when that in the beginning and, and actually I, I was crying a lot, but the way that it was, uh, expressing itself was in ways beyond crying. I had, I developed a horrible skin rash. Mm -hmm. I developed all kinds of, all kinds of rashes that I've never had everywhere in my mm -hmm. mouth. Like it was crazy. I got sick. My body like kind of broke down from that. Um, because I've never, I've never like that kind of traumatic event has never, I mean, I've, yeah. I've been pretty sheltered, you know, and I've had a, a pretty, pretty easy life and, and haven't had that much loss. So this kind of loss with somebody that I had been with and, and you know, when you tour with people, you live with them. You're That's right. like, <laughs> those are your people. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was a lot. And also I hadn't seen Lawrence for months before that happened. So I felt like I wish I could have seen him at least before that, you know, yeah. it had been a long time. So, so there's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of different emotions. There's anger. I mean, I, and I don't even want to get into the fact that I know the woman that was there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's a lot to deal with, but, um, but there's a community and that, that, um, I mean, it makes me, it makes me emotional thinking about also just the community around him and the people that I can call and say, yeah, hey, I'm feeling terrible about this. Let's talk right. about this, you know? Right. And, and Paul Sakivi and Aaron Deal were so, I mean, I, I remember just being able to just hold them. And you know, it was one thing I'll laugh about. We were at the funeral and they have these women who have Kleenex and they give you the Kleenex, you know? So I'll call them the Kleenex ladies. So they're in their yeah. uniform. They just give you hand me the Kleenex. And I was a mess at that funeral. And I was crying, crying, crying. So the Kleenex lady ended up just having to sit next to me. <laughs> 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 and hold me. And yeah. Oh, <laughs> you had your own Kleenex lady, huh? My own lady. I can um, dig it. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Brother Lawrence wasn't here very long, but uh, he really did touch all of those that knew him. He really did. He really yeah. did. Um, I saw him just a couple of months. I think it was a couple of months when, when he briefly was living in Paris. 
and uh, Melissa and I were over there, and um, I had to play at this award ceremony. And Melissa and I were just supposed to play a duet. But uh, the dude said, hey, uh, Lawrence Levins is in the audience. I said, no, get him up here. And so uh, me, him, and, and Melissa did a thing together. And then, lo and behold, just uh, you a know, short time later, there it is. Well, Cecile, you um, all those stories and your experiences, as I said before, you do such a, a, a wonderful thing the way you uh, channel them. And, and the way you sing to us, uh, you always make us feel better. One last person I want to ask you about, uh, and that's the person I mentioned at the very top of this interview, is uh, Mr. Sullivan Fortner. I want to hear the story. Come on. Tell, uh, the, tell the world. So I met Sullivan on the street in Harlem. <laughs> that sounds funny already. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Jasmia Horn, the great Jasmia Horn. Yes. And I was going to school with her at the new school. And so she introduced us. And then I saw him at various jam sessions at Dizzy's. Yeah. And maybe I sang with him a couple times. And I really loved his playing a lot. Yeah. Um, and he actually called me for a gig, for a duo gig at Mesro. Mm. And... I said, what the hell, let's try. <laughs> and wow. it was so much fun. I mean, I, um, we played, I remember we played Every Time We Say Goodbye, and he brought me to tears. What he played really just brought me to tears. And it's hard, it's, it's hard for me to get emotional when I'm on stage because I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to do what I do or try yeah. to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but he got me. And... I just remembered that I really wanted to continue playing with him. And so uh, we did a couple duo gigs here and there, and then it just built into this long lasting relationship of, of playing music together. And it's just been amazing. He's, he's so much fun. He's a lot of fun. Um, and, and I'm really grateful to, to know him. Such a sweet story. <laughs> <laughs> That's so beautiful. <laughs> you guys are awesome. And yes, Su Sullivan is he's a monster. That Truly. that that brother there can, he can play that that, that well tempered clavier. Truly. Um <laughs> since we are on the Newport Jazz Festival Instagram page, um tell me about the first time you played the Newport Jazz Festival. I'm like trying to pull it up in the. <laughs> um, the first time, that's hard because I am confusing that I'm actually what I'm doing with Newport Jazz right now is every time I've been there has become one time in my mind. Does that happen? Okay. <laughs> so I'm seeing like different. Like, I'm seeing angles from different stages. Oh, I'm yeah. Seeing, like, so, so what is that stage in the middle? In the middle of the area? The, the, the quad stage. The quad. I think that's the yeah. first time I went. I think it was raining. Not sure. Yeah. Um, I met Bob Duro there. Ah. He gave me his book. And I was so excited to meet him because I had been singing a few of his songs. And I love him so much. I mean, he's one of my favorite singers and songwriters. And so that was an incredible moment. I also do remember singing in front of the water. Yeah. In the afternoon with the sun, with the shades on. You got to have the shades <laughs> on. With my band, so with Aaron and Paul and Lawrence, I'm pretty sure, but also with Artemis. Um, yes. I, I went there with Artemis, what was it, last year? Who knows? Yes. Uh, um, uh, I think it was two years. Was it? I think it was two years ago. Who I, knows? I lose track. Who knows what's happening? But um, but it has all sort of Newport has has all like it's like a lint ball in my mind. I'm just, everything is is has conglomerated. <laughs> um, I remember that they have pulled pork like faux pulled pork jackfruit at the <laughs> catering. I remember a lot of hangs at that catering area. Oh, and that's and, that's the hang. 
um, the dressing rooms in the in the portable the portable dressing rooms, but also yes. the dressing rooms in those kind of dorms. Back, back in, in back in the fort. I remember. Who do I remember seeing? I remember. Do I remember Gregory Porter? Is that correct? Yes. I remember Jose James. I'm going correct. to correct. I remember seeing you there for sure. Oh, you definitely would have seen me there. I remember Hutch. Oh, Hutch was supposed to. Oh, we flew there one time. Aaron flew us there with Paul and Hutch. And I we that's with, right. I remember that. Yeah, and we were playing with Kyle Poole, but Hutch said, "Oh, call me up. I would like to play a song with you guys." And we called Hutch up. I was like, "So we have the great reactions," and of course. It was just like, where is he? And then we just continued on. <laughs> <laughs> well, so he, he, he didn't make owes it. Me, he still owes me a song. Ooh. Wait, wait. He owes me one. <laughs> so wait, Hutch, Hutch bummed a flight with you guys and then didn't show up? No, he, played, he was playing with Aaron's. Aaron's oh, show. I see. Yeah. He's on Aaron's <laughs> record. Yes, yes. So they were all playing right. with that trio. Well, we got, you know, this is all archived, so I'll make sure I'll send this to Hutch so uh, he can <laughs> see nothing, that. I mean, it's nothing but great memories at, at Newport um, and seeing great musicians. I remember even, I remember seeing John Baptiste in like a bubblegum pink, or was it a banana <laughs> yellow suit, just like full suit? Maybe both. Um, maybe both. Um, it's, I love, I love that festival. I love yeah. it. It's it's so much fun. I actually got to meet this was not this was kind of Newport Jazz Festival, but it was also Newport Folk meeting okay. together at the gala. I met this great couple of guys, a band called Milk Carton Kids, um, mm -hmm. and, and became good friends with, with them and um actually yeah that that was an interesting gal. I'm not, I won't say anything else. <laughs> I'm going to zip, zip it up. Zip it up. <laughs> you will take that one offline. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, I about something else. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, meeting George Ween? Oh, I met him actually in his apartment in New York. And I don't know if he is comfortable with me blowing up his apartment, but <laughs> that place has some of the most beautiful art. Yes. Just incredible. And I remember seeing he has a painting by Chagall, one of, one of these painters that I absolutely love. And I looked at him, I was like, is that, a, is that like a real Chagall? <laughs> like I've only ever seen it in museums. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And, um, and he's just such a sweet, sweet person. Um, Last time I saw him, I think I was singing a song at his house, duo with, with Sullivan Fortner. Wow. Well, I'm sure, um, I know George just got Instagram put on his cell phone a couple of weeks ago. Hi, so George. he might be watching uh, <laughs> in case he is. What's up, George? Hey. Oh, man. So listen, before we, uh, before we call it a night, let's take a couple of questions from uh, yeah, sure. our viewers. Post genre media ask, what most attracted you to the Artemis project? Well, I could lie, but I'm not gonna lie. I will say that playing with women attracted me, but I will mostly say that that particular band with those particular musicians yeah. really got me excited. So it was two things at the same time. Um, and actually, the first gig that we did was uh, was a different band. I mean, it was everyone except uh, the bass player was Linda, Linda Mayhem. Oh, okay. And the drummer was Terry Lynn Carrington. And so I was, I mean, Rini Rosmus, Ingrid Jensen, Anat Cohen, Melissa Aldana, I'm there. Yeah. Melissa Aldana in particular, that is my sister. If she is somewhere, I am there. So yeah. I think I think Melissa is is definitely someone that I I mean I'm I love her. So yeah, she is amazing. And and I and I so I didn't know I didn't know these these women that much. I keep saying women, but these musicians, right? I didn't know them that much. Um, but then I got to know them, and and 
I had such an incredible time. I mean, the first gig, I had an incredible time. And then we did a tour in July, and it was amazing. One of the, one of the most amazing tours I've been on. So, so much fun. And so, um, so, so that's the story. <laughs> Well, it certainly was a uh, it was a thrill to hear you all live, and um, I heard the group. Um, well, the last gig I played pretty much um, when we did the uh, jazz cruise earlier this year, and um, and then I went to Europe with Chick Corea, and then Rona came, said, "I'm here." Yep, <laughs> here to stay. <laughs> That's right. So let's see. Um, <laughs> Piano Man has a question. Who was the boy that Leftover was written about? <laughs> Leftover, I will, what I will say is that Leftover was at first written about one person, like when I started writing it. And then when I finished it, it was a totally different person. So that says a lot also about the amount of time it took me. I got, I had the time to get over someone, get into someone new to, before, so, so that I could write that song. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> I can understand. <laughs> Let's see. But that's um, a good question and I'm not gonna answer it specifically. <laughs> Oh, it looks like Warren Wolf is on here. What's Hi, up, Warren Wolf? Wolf? You can see his his question. Warren about... Wolf. So Warren Wolf is on this project. Yes. I have to, I have to preface that by saying, um, Ogress is a fairy tale, a musical fairy tale that I wrote where I sing the the role of the narrator who then embodies all the different characters. It's 90 minutes long or 85 minutes long. It's about a woman who lives in the woods and who eats anybody who tries to um, cross her boundaries. Um, <laughs> and she, she makes French recipes out of, the, out of the villagers that she eats. And it's also a love story. And it's also a story about <laughs> our relationship to nature. It's yes. also a story about, um, about culture and race and uh, the fetishism of black women. And it's a tribute to the Venus Hottentot. And I wrote, um, and I should say the Venus Hottentot is a South African woman that they took yes. to Europe and showed her as a freak show for years uh, in salons in, in Europe in the 1800s. They would just walk, stand around her and gawk at her. And eventually when she died, she was put in a museum. She wasn't even given a proper burial. She was just put in a museum so that people could go and visit and look at her. And finally in the 70s, she was given a proper burial. And so that story is also a tribute to her. But um, it's with, or and it's with a 13 piece band arranged by the great Darcy James Argue. There's vibraphone, there's a string quartet, there's a marimba, vibraphone and marimba, there's banjo and guitar, there's piano, organ, and melodica, there is cornet, there are all kinds of woodwinds. If I were to list the woodwinds, a lot of them are played by Alexa Tarantino. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. Tom Christensen, uh, there is tuba and trombone. Um, Darcy is conducting us, and it's all music and lyrics that I wrote sitting at the piano every day a little bit, little at a time. And we are working hard on making it into an animated feature-length film. Yeah, it it has to be. It has to be, I agree. And if we do, and when, I should say, when we do, it will be the first animated feature-length film made by a Black woman. Ooh. Which is crazy. Yeah, if you think that about the crazy. history of animation, that should have been done long ago. Right, right. Hey, well, <laughs> take that crown, my friend. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. It may take us 10 years to make it. You'll get it. You'll get it. Do you know Wayne Shorter at all? A little. Has, does he I know mean, about I this? I know him. I know him, you know. D does he know about this project? I don't think so. I, 
I, I got to make the connection. This is oh. right up his alley. Well, that's kind. <laughs> that's kind wow. of Wow. I've, I've met what? him a few times, and he's, I mean, what a sweet person, but also what a deep mind. What a yeah. deep, deep, deep mind. I mean, the depth of this person's mind is wild. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to take one last question. Um, just some new, some new questions in here. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to let you answer that. Nah. Who is your bestest friend besides mom? That's, that's hard. I can't do by, that. By the way, your mom rocks. My what mom was does it? rock. What was the thing you said? She said I jinxed you or something like that. Oh <laughs> my god! This was okay. This was the first time I went to the Grammys. We share a limo. I'm, I'm bragging right now at this point. This whole story is bragging, but it it ends it ends badly. So so don't worry. <laughs> so. We shared a limo with Christian McBride. We get to the Grammys, and you kept telling my mom, she's going to get it. She's going to get it. She's going to get it. I know it. She's going to get it. And you built it up. <laughs> and she kept saying, no, no, of course not. Of course she's not going to get it. And when, obviously, they called Gregory Porter's name, which was, I mean, that was, of course, going to be the thing that happened. She smacked you on this on this. <laughs> She's like, I told you she wasn't gonna get it. I told her, I told her. <laughs> you were like, no. Gotta show support for my friend. Oh, I love it. I love it. I mean, look, we were, you were, you were, you were boosting us up when at the time and, when we needed know. it. Because I mean, that year, I mean, of course, Gregory Porter is absolutely incredible incredible oh, he's he's amazing yes he is and i'm i'm such a fan of his i'm such yeah. a fan i'm that oof, okay but um but i cannot i that question is hard that question is hard well i'll tell you what your voice is a best friend to us thank you <laughs> And uh, I'd like to thank you for being my guest this evening on Live Wax. And, uh, you know, I really look forward to the day we can make some music together. Me too. Me too. It, every time that's happened, it's been such yeah. a pleasure for me. I mean, I've had so much fun singing with you in whatever context. It hasn't been many times, but every time it's been beautiful. I oh, love man. It. I love it. I'm such a fan. I have you, a question hey, for you. you lay, lay it on. What is, I'm looking at your background. And yes. I'm looking at these binders, these white binders. Yes. Alphabetical. Yeah, those What's are all CDs. There? CDs. Yeah. I got rid of the plastic covers, and so I just kept the booklets and the actual Smart. CD, and they're all in those binders. And you still listen to them? On occasion. I mean, most of my CDs are burned onto a separate hard drive, so... Um, it's rare that I go in there and actually pull the CD out and put it in. But uh, on occasion, I might do that. I'm definitely all about my records, though. I yeah, listen I to my vinyl the all the time. I can see the records. I got a whole stack down here, too. Some back there. What this is whole... the one you're listening to now? Like, what's the uh, one that's, that's open now? I just got Maceo Parker's new album in the mail yesterday. Great. And so, uh, so that's I've been happening. checking this out. Yeah, and uh, needless to say, it's just grits and gravy and neck bones and ham hocks and, and, and collard greens and <laughs> hog head cheese and <laughs> it's just it's just soulful. <laughs> <laughs> so, Cecile, let's let's uh, let's make a date again soon to talk and catch up. I love it. And um, I'm Melissa. I don't know where she is, but uh, we're sending big hugs to you. Give her a big, big hug. And uh, please take care of yourself. Thank you. And uh, all of you that tuned in this evening, thank you for tuning in. I will see you next Tuesday evening at seven o'clock. 
And uh, y'all take care and uh, stay safe. Love you, Cecile. Love you. Thank you. All right, you guys. Be cool.